between A.D. 650 and 1900, 10 million to 20 million people were enslaved by Arab slave traders. Others believe that over 20 million enslaved Africans alone had been delivered through the Trans-Saharan route alone to the Islamic world. Dr. John Alambella Azuma estimates in his 2001 book, The Legacy of Arab Islam in Africa, that over 80 million more black people died over that route. The Arab slave trade was so intense, bloody, merciless to say the least. The cruelty on African captives by the Arabs was beyond telling. Similar to the transatlantic slave trade, captured slaves were beaten to be weakened and chained together. However, captured victims in the sub-Saharan slave trade had to endure several weeks of walking through the desert, carrying loads for their new masters from West or East Africa, to where they were eventually sold in the slave markets. Cairo, Baghdad, Istanbul, Mecca, and other centers. These slaves played various roles in the economy of the Muslim world. They were used as servants, harem keepers, laborers in fields, mines, and hydraulic yards, and as cannon fodder in armies. In several of his detailed book about the slave trade, British explorer Henry Hamilton Johnston explains how several slaves died in the desert, while others who fell sick or were badly bruised and could not make it were brutally killed by their masters. David Livingstone, the British missionary, traveler, and explorer, was so upset by the way the Arabs treated their African slaves that he wrote back home in the year 1870. These were his words. In less than I take to talk about it, these unfortunate creatures, 84 of them, wended their way into the village where we were. Some of them, the eldest, were women from 20 to 22 years of age, and there were youths from 18 to 19 years. But the large majority was made up of boys and girls from 7 years to 14 or 15 years of age. A more terrible scene than these men, women, and children I do not think I ever came across. To say that they were emaciated would not give you an idea of what human beings can undergo under certain circumstances. Each of them had his neck in a large forked stick weighing from 30 to 40 pounds and five or six feet long, cut with a fork at the end of it where the branches of a tree spread out. The women were tethered with bark thongs, which are of all things the most cruel to be tied with. Of course, the bark thongs are soft and supple when first stripped off the trees, but a few hours in the sun would make them about as hard as the iron round packing cases. The little children were fastened by thongs to their mothers. As we passed along the path through which these slaves had traveled, I was shown a spot in the bushes where a poor woman the day before, unable to keep up with the march and most likely to hinder it, was cut down by the axe of one of these slave drivers. We went on further and were shown a place where a child lay. It had been recently born, and its mother was unable to carry it from debility and exhaustion. So the slave trader had taken this little infant by its feet and dashed its brains out against one of the trees and thrown it in there. Such was the brutality meted out to the Africans by the Arabs. Looking at all this in a very factly honest manner, the totality of the unthinkable horrid practices beset it upon a certain group of people. Historians agree that it is a mistake to equate the bare survival of Africa with cultural or social or economic stagnation, for the slave trade visited such panoply of tragically interconnected disasters into the lives of every African for centuries, so that they have worked their way into the very racial memory of the continent and its people, particularly females, that only with time and kindness can it be expunged from the psyche of Africa. The Arabs' treatment of black Africans can aptly be termed an African genocide. Arabs killed more Africans in transit, especially when crossing the Sahara Desert, than Europeans and Americans combined, and over more centuries, both before and after the years of the Atlantic slave trade. Arab Muslims began extracting millions of black African slaves centuries before Christian nations did. Arab slave traders removed slaves from Africa for about 13 centuries compared to the three centuries of the Atlantic slave trade. African slaves transported by Arabs across the Sahara Desert died more often than slaves making the Middle Passage to the New World by ship. Slaves invariably died within five years if they worked in the Ottoman Empire's Sahara salt mines. Black Africans did not enjoy immunity to many of the diseases found in the Arab world, which also resulted in high death rates. In West Africa, the Arab slave trade encompassed a vast region from the Niger Valley to the Gulf of Guinea. This traffic followed the Trans-Saharan roads. The crossing could last up to three months with a high mortality rate due to the dire conditions of the trip. Here is the testimony of the German explorer Gustav Nachtigall. 
The Arab slave trade was characterized by appalling violence, rape, and worse of all, castration of black male slaves. While African women and girls were targeted, captured, and deported by Arab slavers for use as sex slaves, the male captives were, on the other hand, pitilessly castrated to prevent them from reproducing and becoming a stock. Castration of male slaves became a habit among slave traders due to the fact that they were in higher demand, stronger, noted to work faster and more efficiently, and were not a threat to slave masters and owners who feared that their wives, concubines, and female slaves would have affairs with them. The suffering inflicted on the victims of castration was profound, encompassing physical and psychological trauma. Castration was done to boys between the ages of 9 and 12, as it was believed that they survived the process more than an adult or adolescent. Although very many did not survive the process, as they often died during or after the harrowing operation. Whites died more, so slavers concentrated more on blacks. This was the darkest chapter in history that highlights the extent to which humans were dehumanized and exploited for gain. Here's a more detailed insight into this practice. 1. Economic factors. One of the primary reasons for castrating male captives was economic. The exporting countries had good economic incentives to castrate male slaves before they were shipped off. In the medieval slaving industry that was designed for exporting Slavic prisoners of war to the Arab world, castrating the slaves was an integral part of the process. Castration was then performed in the famous castration houses in Venice. Eunuchs, or castrated male slaves, were highly sought after due to their perceived trustworthiness and reliability. Eunuchs were considered valuable commodities in Arab societies, thus fetching much higher prices in slave markets compared to non-castrated slaves. Their lack of reproductive capability meant that they could serve in positions of trust and authority without posing a threat to the owner's hereditary wealth and power. Eunuchs were often employed in sensitive positions such as harem guards, administrative posts, and as servants in elite households. They served in influential positions in the Abbasid Caliphate's administration, with some even rising to the rank of vizier. The economic incentives gained by slave traders from exporting black eunuchs to the Arab nations encouraged the practice of castration. In some cases, such as the Zanj Rebellion in the 9th century Iraq, castrated slaves were sought after to work in dangerous and demanding environments like salt mines. This practice had persisted for centuries in the Arab slave trade. As late as 1903, there were still 194 African eunuchs in service to the Ottoman ruling family. 2. Control and Domination Castration was employed by Arab slavers as a means of exerting control and dominance over their male captives. By removing their ability to procreate, the slavers aimed to eliminate any potential threats of rebellion or the establishment of rival lineages. Additionally, castration was intended to ensure that these slaves would remain solely devoted to their master's demands without the distractions of family or personal attachments. 3. Social Dislocation Enslaved males who were castrated were forcibly removed from their communities and families. This social dislocation had far-reaching consequences as it disrupted the social fabric of African societies and led to imbalanced gender ratios. In regions where castration was prevalent, such as East Africa and the Sudan, entire villages were affected as young men were captured and subjected to this brutal practice. Many eunuchs who served in the harem of the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul remained in servitude for life, isolated from their African roots. Their roles as loyal servants or guards sometimes meant they were isolated from their own cultural backgrounds and communities for life. Young boys were captured and castrated so that when they grew up, they could serve as eunuchs in harems. This slave ship was photographed in 1896. This large group of young boys may have been destined for castration to serve as eunuchs. The slaves in the photograph were headed to a Muslim country well after the American Civil War. In fact, slavery in the United States was a good bit more humane than slavery in the Arab world. It was bloody for Africans, bloody beyond words. In some cases, African societies would engage in castration as a preemptive measure to protect their youth from being captured and castrated by Arab slave traders. This reflects the deep fear and trauma associated with this practice. 4. Psychological and Physical Trauma Castration was itself a traumatic experience, both physically and psychologically, for those subjected to it. The surgery itself was often performed without anesthesia under crude and unhygienic conditions, leading to excruciating pain and a high risk of infection. Many African boys did not survive their castration surgery. 
Six out of every ten people who were mutilated died from their wounds in castration centers. This is a prime reason why there are not many communities of blacks living in the non-African Muslim world today, despite the millions of black African slaves who were sold into the Muslim world. Castration led to hormonal imbalances on survivors, affecting the physical development and health of victims. Without testosterone, eunuchs often suffered from various health issues such as decreased muscle mass, fatigue, obesity, osteoporosis, and a lack of secondary sexual characteristics. Five, cultural and religious beliefs. Some societies believed that castrated individuals were spiritually purer and more suitable for certain religious duties. For instance, in some Islamic societies, eunuchs were considered more appropriate for guarding holy sites. The guardianship of the Holy Kaaba in Mecca included the use of African eunuchs. Some men were castrated to be eunuchs in domestic service and the practice of neutering male slaves was not limited to only black males. The Khalifa in Baghdad at the beginning of the 10th century had 7,000 black eunuchs and 4,000 white eunuchs in his palace, writes author Ronald Siegel in his 2002 book Islam's Black Slaves, The Other Black Diaspora. In the Arab world, demand for castrated slaves was so high that even with the appalling death rate from the procedure, it was still profitable which explains why there is no large African diaspora community in Arab countries. Castrated men don't father children. The Arab slave trade had a tragic impact on the evolution of African societies. Some areas were completely devastated and depopulated. Welsh explorer Henry Morton Stanley, from 1841 to 1904, was a horrified witness of this traffic. He wrote that after the depredations of the Arab traffickers, the black blood flows toward the north, the equator smells corpses. As one commentator puts it, could it be true that the corrosive effects of four centuries of commerce in humans, with its temptation, its inbuilt opportunism, its reduction of humans to a cash value, its cycles of revenge and its inevitable physical brutality, have built lasting flaws into the African pattern of thought and action? The United Nations has made March 23 the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade, and UNESCO has made August 23 the International Day for the Remembrance of the Slave Trade and its Abolition. When will there be an International Day to commemorate the victims of the Arab Muslim slave trade? When will an international research program address this subject? When will a project be implemented to identify, restore and publicize the sites and monuments linked to this Arab trade, like the existing projects concerning the transatlantic trade? When will educational material be produced and cultural and artistic programs conducted to raise awareness of this criminal activity? When will a museum on the Arab Muslim slave trade be established? This is Psalms 59 and 5. Thou therefore, O Yahweh Bashem Yashai, power of hosts, the power of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. Salah. Shalom, Kahala Yahweh, Bashem Yashai, Bashem Rukakradash, Double honors my teachers, the apostles and elders of Great Millstone. Peace and mercy to the elect, where the house of David be born again in this generation. And Shalom to the one third of Yasharala, who today are known as the Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans, who before losing our true heritage, we were known as and still are the true Hebrew Israelites of the Holy Bible. In today's lesson, we're going to go into the sub-Saharan slave trade, which the two videos that we just played were about, and it gave a, a pretty good primer of what that slave trade was all about. Now, that slave trade happened to the Southern Kingdom before the more famous North Atlantic slave trade. And I'm bringing this out because I, I've been wanting to make a lesson on this for a while. And especially whenever I see a Jake, a, a so-called Negro, jump into the man-made religion of Islam. Because Islam has a very violent past with us Israelites. You see, a lot of our people who haven't managed to reach the, this truth, right? In fact, let's get this real quick. This is Romans 11 and 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. 
and the rest are talking about the two-thirds of the Negro Latino and Native Americans and anybody whose father's lineage goes back to that bloodline. You see, the, this tells you very clearly that the election, which is one out of every three Negro Latino and Native Americans and anybody whose father's lineage goes back to that bloodline, will eventually wake up to the true narrative of the Bible and of the world. But for the other two-thirds, the rest, they're going to be blinded. And what does this mean? Well, this means that they're never going to come into this truth of the Bible and of who they are and fully understand it or believe it until they make it into the kingdom through reincarnation. Okay, these are the celebrities, these rappers, these people that are within our community who are now practicing Islam, right? Because they believe that is the the true way to get to God, right? Because they've either been disenchanted by man-made Christianity, man-made Catholicism, man-made, uh, you know, Baptist religion, and all these type of man-made religions, right? So what do they do? Well, they see the the Arabs, or they see the other, uh, you know, nations like the African nations, the true African nations, and they're following these this religion called Islam. And they think that it is the, the righteous way, right? Because of the sternness and the strictness of the religion, right? Andrew Tate himself, who is a Judite, by the way, he, he comes from the tribe of Judah, right? His dad's a so-called Negro, right? He himself has converted to Islam because he says that Islam stands for something, right? But this man, is he's totally blinded by, by what's really going on. Now, you can't tell me that Andrew Tate hasn't heard about the Hebrew Israelites, right? Or that all these other celebrities out there, uh, you know, haven't heard about this truth. They have, right? They, they've heard it in passing or somebody's mentioned it to them. But what happened? This wasn't for them. The Lord made sure that by the time that it hit their ears, that they already had their own biases about it because they either, either listened to the devil and thought it was simply just a, a cult or a fringe movement, right? Or a back to Africa movement. But the point being is that these people who are now joining Islam of our people are blinded and they're actually going back into the older oppressor's religion. This is Exodus 11 to 7. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast that ye know how that Yahweh Bashem Yashai doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel and you see one of the many many reasons that people believe that Islam is the religion for so-called Negroes is because a lot of Africans back on the continent of Africa right that they actually practice islam right and they believe this is the the motherland religion so what they do is they go back and they fall they, you know they they talk to a a brother from the nation of islam right the noi and they start you know dressing in you know suits which come from esau these edomites the so-called caucasian race with their little bow ties which you know, if you're if you're past fucking twelve, man, you shouldn't be wearing no damn bow ties, okay? But the point being is that that scripture that I just read makes it very clear that there's a big big difference between the nation nations that come out of the the, the loins of Ham, right, and the the nation of Israel. Again, you have black cats and black dogs, but they're not related, okay? They're not they're not the same, and just like you have you know, dark pigmented Africans and dark pigmented Israelites, they are not the same. In fact, let's go ahead and read this down here. This is from the Zondervan Bible Dictionary. There's a little cutout that I put here, right? It tells you, it says, Ham, the youngest son of Noah, born probably about 96 years before the flood, and one of eight persons to live through the flood. 
he became the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. So you see, this here on the left, these are the, these are the Hamites, right? The the Ethiopians, the Canaanites, which are now known as the uh, tribes of the South African, right? And also uh, you got Egyptians here and just other African nations that that they try to say that Judah comes from. But again, Judah doesn't come from these people. What happened is that Judah was still in the land of Israel and the Lord basically kicked them out of it by the hands of these Edomites. This is Isaiah 1 and 3. The ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Like I had just mentioned, in Jerusalem, before 70 AD, you had the remnants that had still been in that land after the Messiah came, right? He was crucified, he was resurrected, and he went up into the chariots, and and uh, the apostles went on to, to preach and, and teach the truth of what had happened, and that and to spread the gospel. Now, eventually what ended up happening is about 30 plus years after the, the crucifixion and resurrection of the Messiah, the Israelites, the remaining Israelites, I should say, in the land of Jerusalem has started to become more of a nuisance to the ruling country that, that was over them, that being Rome, which was ran by these Edomites, the so-called Caucasian race. And what ended up happening is during this turmoil, you had a man called Vespasian, who would eventually go on to become emperor, but he, at this point, was like a, a, a general. And the thing is, is he decided that it was time to put an end to the, to the Israelite state and basically destroy uh, the nation of Israel because again they had become rebellious they started to, to rise up against Rome and and it was just a time of turmoil you had a lot of emperors being killed off during this time and there was a lot of chaos in the Roman Empire well Vespasian well you know let's just read it here it, we'll start right here it says it says in the year 65 BC the Roman armies under General Pompey captured Jerusalem right and, and this right here, by the way, is uh, when the Greeks lost control over uh, Jerusalem, okay? This is 65 BC. So this is about 65 years before the Messiah was born. Okay, because remember, up until this time, it, um, Jerusalem was controlled by the Greeks all the way back to, to 333 BC when Alexander the Creek came in and, and basically just took over. Right now, in 65 BC, Pompey, which was the emperor that came before Julius Caesar, uh, he came in and ultimately conquered it from the Greeks. It says, Pompey captured Jerusalem, and in 70 AD, General Vespasian and his son Titus put an end to the Jewish state with great slaughter during the period of the military governors of Palestine. Many outrages and atrocities were committed against the residue of the people during the period from Pompeii to Julius. It was, it has been estimated that over one million Jews fled into Africa, fleeing from Roman persecution and slavery. The slaves' markets were full with black Jewish slaves. So you see. And this is from the book, uh, Babylon to Timbuktu, from uh, Rudolf R. Windsor. So, you see, this here shows you that the Israelites of the southern kingdom, the so-called Negroes, had fled down into Africa during this time. And you, could, you get a more detailed picture of this by reading the Josephus' records from the uh, book, The Wars of the Jews, which tells you what happened how the Romans took out Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, burnt it down, or since, as Flavius says, it was done by accident, 
that the Romans didn't want to do it, which was a bunch of bullshit. Um, but the point here is that there was over a million Israelites that fled down into Africa. Okay? And these thousands of Israelites, right, these thousands, which ultimately made up a million Israelites, ultimately followed their ancestors' steps, right? You had uh, Abraham who went down into Africa. You had uh, Yahweh Shai. Um, you had, I think it was Jacob also went down into Africa. And why is that? Well, because they looked alike, right? You could easily hide amongst people who looked like you, even though they weren't the same people. Now, if you had these Khazarians, these Edomites, who are claiming to be the chosen people going down to Africa, do you think that they would they would uh, be able to blend in with the, the children of Ham? Hell no, they wouldn't be able to. So again, that right there is a, is a, is a cut. Now, back to... Uh, this book right this tells us that not only did a million Israelites flee down into Africa right but we know that through history that that the slave markets that not only you know filled the Roman slave markets but also 600 years down the road because let's get the Bible timeline real quick you go down here right after the Vatican was built mass went on Edom <clears throat> flees up to uh, the Caucasus Mountains after the the slaves that were in Rome end up rising up into the social ladder. Well, the other Israelites who had fled down into Africa thinking that they were going to get away from the punishment that Yahweh had brought on to the nation, they were in for a sore surprise, right? What was that surprise? Well, let's read it here. It says, Arab and Hamite Africans captured and sold an estimated 7.2 million predominantly Israelite refugees in the Arab markets across Northern Africa and across the Silk Road in Asia. So you see, these refugees, Israelites that were in Africa, they basically were encroaching upon the lands of Ham and also upon the lands of, of Ishmael, the Arabs. And what did they do? Well, because these refugees had no homes, had no political power, had no real uh, authority other than what they individually could, could muster themselves as small communities. They were easy pickings. And this is why that, you know, the, the Hamite Africans started to attack and enslave the Israelites that were dwelling in their land because they didn't want them in, in Africa. Right? They wanted them to get them out of that land. Right? There's many videos today showing true Africans admitting that the Negroes are not their brothers. They are not the same people. Okay? They even call them uh, different words. They call them like Akata, which means cotton pickers, or Cocoon, which is like American, American Negroes. Right? And, and there's even a video of, a, of a, an Israelite woman right, of the tribe of Judah who went back to Africa telling the story that she knows that Africa is not her her home right because she got twindled because these Africans a couple of years ago tried to pretend that they were sorry for selling the Israelites into slavery and they told them to come back home well in, in coming back home they're charging them an arm and a leg to live there in Africa it's ridiculous but what what's what's all that for right well that's for this this is Jeremiah 17 and 4. And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. So you see, all that, ha that happened, right? All the Israelites who fled down into Africa eventually had forgotten their heritage, forgot where they came from. You know, they had some understanding, I'm sure, but for the most part, the, the heritage that the Lord had bestowed upon us was gone, right? And only remnants remained enough so that way by the time that these that these Southern Kingdom Israelites would be taken to, to the Americas, that that truth would start to come up again and would start to spread amongst the slaves so that way they could, they could start to remember themselves again, fulfilling the prophecy in Hosea, one in ten about 
how, you know, in the land of our captivity, we would uh, be told that we are the children of God, right? And that's what's happening, right? Because again, this happened to the Southern Kingdom. They lost their heritage. It happened to the Northern Kingdom, the Latinos and the Native Americans. We came over here to the Americas in 600 BC, right? And we were over here for about 2,400 years before they found us, right? Enslaved us and then put us to work, made us lose our heritage and started calling us by different bywords, right? Mexicans and so on, okay? And we eventually forgot that we were the Israelites or that came over here. And this was all, again, to fulfill prophecy. So that way we would have that great falling away that the Messiah talked about that would have to come before the end, right? The great falling away would hap happen and then the man of perdition would be revealed, right? That being these Edomites. And that is what's happening right now, right? Us Israelites, we're coming back to our lost heritage, right? We're coming back to understanding who we are. And these these uh, Edomites, the, the sons of perdition, are being revealed for being the devils that they are. This is Joel 3 and 2. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel whom they have scattered amongst the nations and parted my land right see there's a big payback coming right and that's because you see not only was it these Edomites the so-called Caucasian race that destroyed us as a people right put us into hard bondage right both the southern and northern kingdom but you also had other nations out there like the, the, the Arab nations, Ishmael, right, who was hand in hand with these uh, Hamite Africans that also had a, had a hand in putting us into hard bondage. And this here, by the way, let me bring back the Bible timeline, is where we get the movement of the, of the uh, Moorish Empire. You see, because again, Judah, Levi, and Benjamin, they were all sold into these these Arab Hamite Africans markets as slaves. And eventually, just like in Rome and just like in America, over time, they eventually won their freedom, right? And those that weren't castrated would eventually go on and convert to their master's religion, just like here in America, right? You have many, uh, you had many slaves convert to Christianity because that is what their masters wanted, okay? And this is why today you have a lot of uh, so-called Negroes that practice Protestantism and and are practicing Christianity, right? To the point where a lot of a lot of our people, unbeknownst to them, say that that's the slave man's religion, right? That, that the Bible was made to enslave us, which it wasn't. But they simply took our book, modified it, gave us back a portion of it and use it to justify our slavery. Well, that's the exact same thing that these Arabs did to Judah when they were in Africa, okay? So after Islam was introduced and the sub-Saharan slave trade was well established, you eventually had the, the, the Moors, okay? This is where you get the Moors from. So every time we hear about you know, you have a lost as Israelite coming to our comment boards talking about um, it's all about Moors or, you know, all the Moorish laws and all this. That's a bunch of bullshit because one, the Moor, the Moorish Empire only goes back to about 711 to about 1492 AD. And it comes from the enslavement from the Arab nations. OK, this is why the, the uh, Moors became a thing. Okay, it tells you here, it says, Jews that fled into North Africa, Carthage, and dwelt amongst Ishmael, the Arabs, and took on their, the, their religion of Islam, conquered Spain. It fell in 1492 in the fall of Grenada. So there you have it. So you see, all this Moorish Empire, Islam connection that the Israelites have to, to those institutions is false right it's a fallacy and it and it has no no roots that go back any further than enslavement of the southern kingdom but again this is something that only the elect are gonna realize and the two-thirds are gonna continue to be involve themselves in this 
more stuff, the Islam stuff, the free Palestine stuff, because again, this is why us Hebrew Israelites don't give a crap about what's going on over there in Israel. Because what you have going on over there is Esau fighting Ishmael. Neither of them should be in that land. This is Isaiah 13 and 11. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. And I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. And that's ultimately what the Lord's going to do. That the Lord, when he comes back, not only is he taking out these Edomites who have ruled the world in a malicious and wicked way, but also all the other 16 nations upon the face of the earth. Because remember, there's 18 total, which include the Israelites, which is one nation, the Edomites, which is the other, and the other 16 are the heathen nations, right, which are pretty much just background characters. A lot of those nations are going to go into form of hard captivity and that's because of what they had done to us Israelites in the past now not all nations are going to go into hard captivity the nation of Persia is going to have you know a, a lighter sentence than the others and why is that well because they've done differently to us than other nations have done right they freed us from the Babylonians and they let us go back to our land to rebuild the temple Right? They're also going to be destroying Babylon in the, in the coming soon future. But the point being is that these historic events can't be hidden. And unless you know them, you can't really tell who's your enemy and who's not. And this is why we tell all the Israelites that all these other nations, they're all our enemies. Okay, They all had a part in our downfall. And now a lot of them try to play our friends, try to welcome us back home and saying they're sorry for selling us into slavery and all this that type of bullshit but that ain't gonna work it's too too little too late so either way Akim, i just wanted to highlight this show uh you know where it belongs in our history and how you know this is the roots of islam amongst our people and also of the moorish empire mumbo jumbo amongst our people so hopefully this lesson was edifying Akim. until next time i want to give all honor and glory and praises to yahweh bashem yashai bashem Shalom.